2015 meeting of the Gilderland Board of Education. Would you all please silence your cell phones and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <laughs> the first item on our agenda this evening is our high school student representative. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a stats report on what's been happening in the school lately. So um, recently, actually this weekend on February 10th, was the Class of 2019 Volleyball Tournament. They hosted a volleyball tournament, and after that, the uh, student government had a fundraiser at Chipotle, and that raised over $100, which we received recently at our meeting earlier in the afternoon. And the student government has been send sending out um, newsletters to the students to give them you know, more knowledge on what the student government is doing in the school and what they're planning later so they don't just stay, let's say, um, empty-minded about what's going on. And the student government has been... Uh, addressing many issues in the school, including broken locks in the lo um, bathrooms, parking lot doors open after 7.30 for the um, students, heating in classes. Well, these issues are the main focuses of the student government at the moment and are being handled by the student life committee that we have. And regar in regards to music, the annual Pops concert was hosted here at GHS on February 3rd and went, went very really well. And with sports, spring sports sign-ups um, began a while back, and that's been going on. Quarter three also began recently. And the student government is also, um, right after break, the week after break, is hosting a spirit week for the students. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is public comment number one. We have several individuals signed up this evening, and just as a reminder... In accordance with our policy, I would ask that you keep your remarks to between three and five minutes. Uh, the first person is Michael Horalchak. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Horalchak. I'm a Gilderland graduate and parent of three children currently attending Gilderland Elementary School. I spoke before the last two board meetings to share my perspective on the board's discussions about potentially modifying the kindergarten entrance age policy. After attending last week's policy committee meeting at which the Kindergarten en Enrollment Advisory Committee presented its recommendations, and after carefully reviewing the written report issued by the Advisory com Committee justifying these recommendations, I come before you again tonight. In the remainder of my comments, I will focus on two issues. First, the Advisory Committee's recommendation that the district maintain an inflexible one-size-fits-all policy based solely and entirely on student age with no consideration of student aptitude, maturity, or school readiness. And second, the Advisory Committee's alternative proposal, which would establish criteria for early kindergarten entrance more, more stringent than those used at other districts in the state that allow early entrance. First, with respect to the Advisory Committee's rejection of any individualized consideration of students, I'm struck by the one-sided nature of the report, which leaves the strong impression that the Advisory Committee set out to justify a predetermined outcome. Let me be concrete. Immediately before presenting its policy recommendation, the Advisory Committee's report contains a lengthy bullet list summary of concerns that should be taken into consideration when drafting an entrance age policy. Every one of these concerns points to potential harms caused by admitting a child who lacks sufficient physical, emotional, or academic development, but there is not a single mention in the entire document of any potential benefits of attending kindergarten for a child who is ready to begin school, or any acknowledgement of potential harms to a child who is kindergarten ready but denied access. These concerns are well attested in the academic literature and include boredom and disengagement due to insufficiently challenging work and an accompanying failure to develop good study habits, disruptions that come from being skipped ahead of grade, a practice which, contrary to suggestions at last week's policy meeting, Gilderland does in fact engage in, and in later years, the potential for high-risk behaviors in older children who are exposed to additional risks by virtue of their age first among their peers with legal access to social media sites, first to drive, first able to buy tickets to R-rated movies or cigarettes. The Advisory Committee's report shows no sign of having considered any of the risks or benefits on the other side of the ledger. It's unsurprising that such a one-sided focus would lead to the conclusion that no exception should be made. My time is limited, so my com comments on the alternative proposal must necessarily be brief. 
This proposal is based on the existing policy at Shenandoah. We're told that Shenandoah's experience has been two to three students per year meeting the qualifications for early entrance. Assuming a comparable experience and given the relative sizes of the two districts, adopting the Shen policy in Gilderland might be expected to result in one to two qualifying students per year. The advisory committee apparently regards one to two students per year as too lenient and has proposed a number of modifications to the Shenandoah policy, all designed to make it more restrictive, including cutting the age eligibility window in half, imposing much earlier deadlines for application and submission of supporting documentation and test results, and, perhaps most significantly, adding a series of additional subjective evaluations on top of the required tests. While it's certainly appropriate for the district to require early admitted students to demonstrate readiness for kindergarten, I ask the board to scrutinize the criteria advocated by the advisory committee and ask whether they actually serve that purpose or are instead simply unnecessary barriers to access to kindergarten. I have much more to say on this topic, including extensive detailed thoughts on the advisory committee's report and presentation, but time constraints prevent me from presenting them in this forum. In each of my previous public comments, I've invited members of the board to contact me to discuss these issues further. To date, only one board member has taken me up on this offer, but I again renew this invitation. In the last week alone, I've spent many hours carefully reviewing the advisory committee's report and conducting additional research, and I would welcome the opportunity to provide a very different but well-informed perspective on the advisory committee's prescriptions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Tara malloy Grocky. Hi, good evening. My name is Tara malloy Grocky. I am a resident, a parent, a second grade teacher at Gilderland Elementary School, and I am president of the Gilderland Teachers Association. I am speaking this evening in regards to the potential change to the kindergarten entrance age policy, and I'm asking you to please listen to the experts in the classroom, the kindergarten teachers, and do not change the policy. New York State is in desperate need of accessible and appropriate early childhood programs for four-year-olds. Sending a four-year-old child to kindergarten too soon, we feel, is not the answer. Finding and creating the proper pre-K setting is. The GTA feels so strongly about this, and we have heard from so many primary teachers that we have helped write a resolution that will go before the NYSED Representative Assembly that will advocate for legislation that would require students entering kindergarten be at least five years old by September 1st. So just an idea, and I don't know how to do this, but can we somehow collaborate, board, district, everybody, and let's go and figure out a way to get the right setting for these four-year-olds. They're four years old. They need to be with kids their age. It's not just about the academic setting. It's their kids. They need different things. And putting them in kindergarten too soon, we feel very strongly, is not the answer. This is what I hear from all the kindergarten teachers. And as a primary teacher for the last 10 years, it's not the answer. So please take that in consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Carrie Deneen. Hi, um, my name is Carrie Deneen, and I teach K through five music at Pine Bush Elementary. Um, I think Tara pretty sums she summed it up pretty well with everything I was going to say. Um, and I teach kindergarten in music, and I am not in favor of moving this pa back past the December date, as my colleagues, as we heard, are in the same agreement on that. Um, I don't know why as a school, I don't really know how we got here at this point. I feel like it's a, um, a problem looking for, or a solution looking for a problem that we haven't had. Um, and I, I really don't feel strong, I feel strongly we can't compare ourselves to a half day program at another school that is, it's like apples and oranges to me because we don't have that any longer. Um, this committee reported out to all of our schools, to all of us, you know, how things were going and what they were doing. And, you know, they have done research. They, have, they are the experts, and we are the experts in the classroom. We see what we see now with the um, December 1st date. And this resolution you know, that, that schools are trying to put forward to September 1st um, really seems like the right direction to move based on what we're seeing by the majority of students coming to our district. Um, you know, they were asked to come up with a plan B in case the board didn't listen to this, you know, these stakeholders who would do this every day, uh, these professionals. And I, I guess I was curious about why do they even need a plan B? If they are the professionals and, you know, why would you not hear them? Um, 
why would we even consider changing this now until we wait to see how a resolution being moved by several schools may be going towards the legislature eventually? Why would we do that now? Um, and I think, you know, if someone, I have a feeling later on, I, I, I'll hear the word that where have people been, where have GTA members been or staff members been not at the board meeting saying anything on this subject until now, until tonight, just two of us being here. And I think, you know, we have this committee, this childhood committee that was working with district office to discuss this matter. We have faith in that. We have faith in those committees, and we are, have a district that's based on shared decision making. And if this committee com does all this work and says, you know what, here is what's best for kids that are coming here to Gilderland, then I'm hoping as a board that you go ahead and listen to that, not try to find a plan B. Well, that's great, but let's find something else. I'm really hoping that that shared decision making is what we make policy on. Not, okay, you only showed up to the third meeting to talk, because honestly, I didn't think we had to. I thought this was going to go through the right process. Um, you know, so I'm hoping that you'll make the right decision here. My only last thought is if you go with something such as a plan B that was in the report later on, um, that, that had to do with uh, putting together assessments for these kids if we moved a date forward throughout the year and, and developing them and what would have to be done for these children to go through. That takes some time. We're even past those dates for the plan B. So even if you decide to move something forward, it needs to take its time to be developed. It cannot be rushed through this spring. I mean, I don't know what the rush would be, but it shouldn't be rushed through this spring. I will leave you with one thing that came out on tonight's news, which is babies born in September are more successful than peers. Why is that? Because they often have to wait a year before starting school, which gives them a cognitive advantage. It came out tonight, it was on the news. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the 2018-19 budget development presentation. Yes, Tim. Um, can we, since this has been a pretty big topic, can we suspend the rules and move the kindergarten discussion to now while we have a lot of people in the audience to, you know, who would benefit from that right um, now at this time? We can uh, make a motion to suspend the rules, I guess, to discuss it now. Or we, I, I don't know if we do. We're just moving an item up on the agenda. Do we need to suspend the rules to do that? I thought we had before. Okay. Um, Tim makes a motion to suspend the rules to discuss the entrance age policy at this time. Um, do I have a second for that? I'll second it. Alan, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we can move forward with this discussion. Uh, Tim, do you want to start it off? I would love to start one, it off, yes. Sorry, there's um, one opposed here. One opposed, one and opposed that was? Gloria. Gloria, okay. Yeah, I, I'm... Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said opposed. My fault. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to start it off. Um, I'm, I'm on the policy committee where we've been discussing this on and off. Uh, Mrs. Rivera, Mrs. Guido, and Ms. Barber also on that committee. So we've been, um, did I get that right or did I no, mess up the Ms. committees? Barber, Mrs. Frederico. You're not on okay. Uh, oh, I goofed up the audit with the uh, <laughs> so many committees, so little time. I was there but, in spirit. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but we have been talking about this on and off since September. Um, and I think everybody in the room, uh, we wear different hats. Uh, we have our, our job hat. We have our parent hat. We have our... All, all sorts of different hats, bowling team hat. I mean, we all have different pursuits and different things going on. So we come at all, uh, any uh, issue like this from, from many different angles. Um, so I'm going to have different hats on my comments. I'm going to have an educator hat, a parent hat, and then the school board hat. Um, so from an educator standpoint, as far as this uh, early entrance to kindergarten goes, um, in listening to colleagues across the district and um, people who are on the committee, this uh, early entrance to kindergarten committee, uh, one, one thing that I've heard from them is that we should think about this as more than just being kindergarten ready. That once you start going down this road, are, are you phys ed ready when you get into school? Are you art ready? Are you music ready? Are you lunchroom ready? Are you on and off the bus ready? Uh, all of those are elements for this decision 
just in that first year of kindergarten, you got to look even farther down the road. Will you be fourth and fifth grade ready? Um, all of us who have taught have experiences where we have a 10-month a swing between students in our classes. And uh, all kids are different. Some kids are going to be able to handle that. But a lot of times you, you see the kid at the lower end of that 10-month spectrum who, who uh, struggles at times. Uh, and it's due to that age factor. Um, 30 years of teaching, I've seen it many times in the classroom. And I know my colleagues at all levels, whether it's kindergarten, whether it's fourth grade, whether it's uh, 12th grade, uh, you're going to see these kinds of uh, issues pop up. Um, are you middle school ready? We know middle school is a huge transformational time for, for our students. Are we going to put them into a little bit of a disadvantage if they're at the younger end of the spectrum? Um, and, and the same goes down the road for uh, high school ready. And, and I would especially look at college ready. Um, do, you, do you really want your 17-year-old going off to college? Um, again, everybody's different. Some will thrive and be successful, I'm sure. Uh, but it's, it gives you pause. I, I would just pause and uh, think it through and, and just wonder if it's that big of an issue to really push our students, our youngest learners, right into school when they're, they're not even five. Um, uh, along with that, and I'm sorry, my notes on here are very small. Um, just from this process since September, uh, you know, we were told early on that elementary principals did not think this was a good idea. And I know I made a comment at a board meeting that we should stop driving down the road. Once we heard that, that was kind of good enough for me in the policy committee that I, I felt like we should not continue exploring this, but, but we did. And then we heard from school psychologists who said uh, that it's not a good idea. Um, that really gets my attention when those folks weigh in uh, with that kind of a, of a viewpoint. Um, that means a lot to me. Um, unfortunately, when some of that feedback came in, uh, they were described as being naysayers. And that just concerns me. When, when you get information that doesn't go along with your opinion, uh, you still need to consider it. You can't just dismiss it and then start labeling people as naysayers. I think that's very unfair. I think that's a way to just kind of chill uh, public discourse and debate. So I, didn't, I, I found that very off-putting for that to happen. Um, now we have a committee that, that issues a report. And uh, you, you know when I look at the list of the people on this committee, yeah, I, I know pretty much all of them. And uh, these are excellent, excellent people. Uh, you, can, you can be sure that they've given this very, very thorough and careful thought. Um, I know a lot of these people. They are top notch. Uh, you know, I'll single out April Kearns because she's the one I've worked with the most. And she's a kindergarten teacher at Pine Bush. And if you look up kindergarten teacher in the dictionary, you'll see her picture there. I mean, she is just a perfect example of a kindergarten teacher and a great person on top of that. So again, when I look at all of these people giving the same consistent opinion, that says a lot to me. Um, when they come, come in with an opinion that says they do not believe that early entrance is advisable, uh, that says a lot to me. Um, I'm going to listen to that quite a bit. Um, when you look at how there's something like 40 states in the nation that have a cutoff uh, that lays somewhere between July 31st and October 1st. And so our cutoff is December 1st. Um, so we're outside of, of the norm. Um, so I, I, would, I would echo what Mrs. Moy Grocki said, that we should really be looking at, if we're going to make any change, we should look at a change to September 1st. Uh, that's something I would get on board for. Um, so there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of information. Um, as, as I'm looking through the proposals from the committee that says don't change anything, 
but then they were still tasked with uh, coming up with ideas to change the policy anyway. Um, and you, you end up with this host of dates for cutoffs. Uh, there's January 31st, there's February 1st, there's April 1st, there's May 1st, there's June 15th. This, <laughs> you're taking December 1st, fish or cut bait, and now we're gonna have a whole series of dates where we're gonna to start to uh, struggle on and maybe potentially fudge the lines on. Again, uh, I think you're making, a, you know, I, I would call it a Rubik's Cube type policy. Uh, and th that's gonna be dangerous going, going on. Uh, you're gonna have more confusion and you're gonna have more wiggle room because suddenly April 1st, well, you know, geez, I'm, I'm April 3rd. Let's look at that then. Uh, Again, so, you know, sometimes you just have to have a cutoff, and that's what it is. And if you're before the cutoff, you're in, and if you're after the cutoff, you're not. Uh, that's the way things go. Um, so I, I would really advocate to taking a look at all of this. Um, those are my educator ideas. Um, I know that we've heard this idea about boredom. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to be bored in life. Uh, it's unavoidable. Um, I was going to make a joke about board meetings and how we could play around, you know, like a homophone <laughs> game there. But uh, it, it's just inevitable that you're going to be bored. Um, but I always told my students that you, you never really have to be bored. You can always be challenging yourself. There's always books to read in the classroom. There's the school library. I mean, if you, you, nobody's ever read every book in the classroom in the school library. So there's always something that you can do. And, and trust me, in our classrooms in Gilderland, uh, if you're bored, you're just not engaged. Uh, the teachers are not uh, sitting around. Uh, they're active, they're involved with the students. There's so much going on in the classrooms from kindergarten right up to 12th grade. So uh, boredom, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, everybody can be in charge of, of their own interest level and there's always things we can challenge ourselves with, especially in 2018. I mean, boredom is just, it, it really, it's a choice. Uh, it doesn't have to, you don't, you never have to be bored. You can always be doing something. Um, I know some people complain when they go to the doctor's office and they have to wait an hour. I love that because I always have a book with me and I can read a couple chapters. So, you know, bore, boredom is a state of mind that you can push away really at, at any age because of all the opportunities available. Um, there's been talk about how this is um, this one size fits all kind of idea and that you're being um, exclusive, so we need to be inclusive, but I think that's a that's a tricky one there because by by trying to establish a whole big policy where we're going to be inclusive, you're automatically going to be exclusive because there's going to be some uh, students who you want to get into kindergarten that will not pass the criteria. There you have ex exclusion going on. So I think that's something that needs to be thought out a little bit more also. Um, I probably said way too much already as uh, from the educator hat. I, I will just say as a parent um, and a dad, um, Slow down. Um, our society is getting so fast, and there's even a theory out there called the quickening, that our, we're going to get so fast-paced that we're, we're just going to burn out and cease to function as a society. Um, that's probably a bit extreme. Um, but things are so fast-paced with technology and all of the, all of the uh, you know, attention vying for your attention all the time, uh, that we really should slow down. And, and uh, so as a dad and a parent, I would just really say, uh, don't be in a big rush. Um, and this will be corny, but I will go for it anyway. Um, when I'm driving them around in my truck, I always have this picture with me, which is a little picture of me and my little boys back in Maine, fishing, having the time of our lives. 
I even have a beanie baby in my lap. So sweet. Uh, and now, in March, my, my uh, little boys here will be 25 and 22. And, you know, they're, they're well on their way now in life. And that's a good thing. But boy, as a parent, you wish for these days quite a lot. And you, you really do wish you could go back sometimes. Um, at least I sure do. So I would just say to not be in a rush and just maybe pause slow down a little bit. Um, there's that old country song uh, with a line that says 20 years goes faster than you think. Don't blink. And boy oh boy is that ever true. So uh, just finally I'll wrap it up as a board member. Uh, when I hear so many of our credentialed uh, experts, you know, whether it's principals, elementary principals, whether it's the school psychologists, whether it's uh, kindergarten teachers, and you can't find a one kindergarten teacher who's supportive of this. Um, when we're, we're showing concern about class size, uh, all sorts of issues, um, I, would, I would advocate that if anything, we change the policy from December 1st to September 1st. Otherwise, keep the policy as is, just like the committee recommended. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Those were very thoughtful comments. Um, who, who would like to speak to this next? Well, I think is, I think I had um, Barbara had asked me to um, give the report sure. about the um, uh, the committee's discussion about the policy, and I know that um, Tim is the dissenter on our committee, but I think the other three of us had um, had supported um, allowing children to challenge the. Um, um, into kindergarten, um, but with with following the recommendations that um, that the policy um, that the committee had had um, set forth there about um, limiting the age up to um, I think January 31st and some other um, other uh, uh, things in place to um, evaluate the children is that that is that an accurate statement of, how, of what we discussed I, I think I think that was basically it um, and I think really there was also a sense that um, that we have a we always talk about child-centered and and um, looking at the whole child and um, I guess the the question uh, in my mind at least was well how does how does having a strict age cutoff um, comport with that. So there was just a thought that, well, maybe um, it makes sense. I mean, and, it, and, I, and I know that I can say probably at least back to the 1970s, there have been, you know, a, a real kind of like worry about kids being too young in school, you know, and I guess if you, if you have like me, kind of a lived experience of being a student who was significantly younger than their um, the others in their grade, and you didn't have a disaster, you know? <laughs> I mean, even though that people sometimes seem to almost predict that, then I think that kind of, you know, it gives you a different mindset, maybe. Like, that this isn't a huge problem. I mean, we're talking maybe two students a year, um, according to, you know, the, the, the Shen model. Uh, I don't think that, you know, it's an overwhelming influx of students. And, you know, I understand that the research is mixed and that, that the, it's probably some extra work for people to evaluate these children. And I understand that. And it's probably not the thing that a lot of, um, people want to do, but I think that just um, based upon the committee discussion and I think at least three of us were in favor and obviously Tim was against. <laughs> any, any other comments? Oh, Judy? <laughs> oh, sure, Judy. Uh, I, Listening uh, to what people have said 
uh, Mr. Horalchek and uh, people here, just uh, personal experience from years ago. My sister, who is older than I am, I'm one of seven children, she's older than I am, and I always thought she was the smartest one in the family. Her birthday was December 30th, and so she was probably the youngest person in her class. And she still talks about how she hated school because she worked so hard and it was so much easier for everybody else. And I've always sort of remembered that thinking, maybe that's not a good idea. And I think if we change the age, I agree with, with Tim, um, that I would like to see it September 1st, all kids are five years old when they start kindergarten. And I think that's good. I think if we start saying, well, December 2nd, December 15th, whatever it is, we start down a slippery slope and I would just as soon not, if we're going to change it, I, I would prefer changing it back maybe gradually over the course of years so that it's, it's not, we don't have a gap of those three months. But I think that um, I would rather see us keep it at least at December 1st and, and even move it backwards. I think it would be beneficial to kids. Um, everybody may have individual exceptions, but that's really what I feel. So. Thank you. Alan? Uh, I appreciate everybody else's comments. Uh, my comments are really kind of about the report itself. Uh, I, I, found, I read the report. I was a little, like Mr. Charlchuk, I was a little disappointed that the report only had the negatives, and it didn't really highlight any of the positives, especially when you read some of the report. And I'll just read a couple comments that I highlighted under the report. If you go to the summary of research, the study found no significant differences between the sampling of reading test scores as a result of the chronological age. So again, I'm kind of perplexed why we have all the negatives and we don't have any positives in the report. It looked, and again, I agree with Mr. Hallcheck. I'm not quite sure because I wasn't on the committee, but uh, it looks like we only looked at the negative aspects. And on another page of the report, it says, uh, largely on whom is asked, proponents of starting kindergarten early believe it gives a child a valuable head start in life. Opponents argue that holding a child back until he or she is more mature provides an academic and social edge. Nowadays, readiness rather than chronological age is often the deciding factor when a child should start school. I mean, that's, that's a lot of the research that's in there. So I guess I'm kind of questioning why when we like to use data to make our decisions, we aren't using the whole set of data and, and showing all of the results of the data from both sides and then presenting the argument based upon the positives and negatives and not only the negatives in the report. Mm -hmm. Teresa? Um, I just have a couple questions actually of the people that are on the policy committee. How did January 31st come to be? Um, I, I have an issue with this. I feel like December 1st is kind of an arbitrary date how does January 31st come that to be? That was a committee that um, came up with their the recommended policy. If it, I think that the, they were, had like two charges. One was what was the recommendation, and then their second was if there were to be policy, what would the language be? And you know, because they're all the experts, they put together the language of what they recommend. So I think they came up with that. Okay. I don't. It was it was none of us. I don't think. So it was the committee. The the committee, committee itself yeah, from that the did school, like all the the experts that yeah okay because um, I kind of had an issue with that date of the January thirty first because I kind of agree that well, first and foremost let's make it clear that we're not saying we're moving the date from December first to January thirty first right that was my understanding was that we we're keeping December first however we were making it possible for children that were born. January up to January 31st to have an exception be made to that rule, correct? I mean, I don't think there was any discussion of what the actual policy was. The, I think okay. the, the, dis, the, the discussion was, should there be a policy or not? And then if there was, then that was their recommendation. But I don't think there was any more discussion about should what Should there happen. be a policy of an extension? Should of, there of be? A, of an inclusion of children that were born later. Right. Should there be a change to what the current policy is? That, that was what was discussed. So we are considering changing December 1st to January 31st? Well, all the, all the details no. was based on what 
that committee. Oh. Barbara, <laughs> saying no. Barbara, Barbara, I'll, cl I'll clarify this. I think what they're looking at right now, the policy says there's a hard cutoff of December 1st, no exceptions. Correct. The, if the board would vote to change that policy to allow for exceptions, that date would remain December 1st, okay. but what would happen if there were to be exceptions? Would those exceptions only be allowed for students born up until January 31st or beyond? That was and my how would that? Yes. Because that's why I was having an issue with some of the issues with it is that we're not saying that we're going to make everybody come in at a younger age, but we are saying that children that are born later could possibly be included in, which I don't really necessarily have an issue with, just for the same reason that as a parent, you can decide to hold your child back and say, my child is born, my, I have a daughter, who, and I myself, and I'm an October birthday. She was born October 7th, and she's always been on the, I don't want to say slower end of the spectrum, but maturity-wise, she could have possibly held back a year, because she's always been at that end where the teachers always said, Come January, February, she catches up and everything's all good. But those first few months of school, every year, she has, she's kind of slower in getting things going because she's a younger child every year. Um, so I could have held her back as a parent, and parents do. Uh, there's children that go to four-year-old school that the teacher says, you know what, he's a November birthday. I think he'd, he'd do better to do four-year-old school one more year and then go to kindergarten as a five-year-old. And that happens as well. So I, I am of, after reading that and understanding as a parent, and like you were saying, Tim, putting on your parent hat, I feel that as a parent, you have the ability to hold your child back if you feel that your child, your particular child, is a genius and is just so mature. Well, why not give that child an opportunity to possibly, not necessarily absolutely, but to possibly move up? I do kind of still have an issue with the January 31st date, though. I just feel like December 1st is arbitrary to me. Um, so I will also go back to either saying, I think you should either do it at the beginning of the school year of being September 1st of that date, or doing December 31st, because at least you're, it makes sense. I think it's not so arbitrary of a date to say either the beginning of the school year, and then everybody is five when they enter kindergarten, or the end of these year itself, the calendar year. I, I just think both dates are arbitrary in my head of December 1st or January 31st. Why not be February 28th? Because it's a leap year? I don't know. Because I, I just feel like it's arbitrary. I don't know if she wanted to go first. Cause Barbara, do you want to speak to this? why the change from the Shenandoah policy, which allows parents to apply through April, I think April 1st. Uh, we took into great consideration um, the report, you know, from the teachers who really recommended the age range. And so that's why, you know, we moved the date to their recommended date, which extended it for about a month. But our cutoff is still December 1st, but the parent can apply uh, if they feel the child is ready, you know, intellectually, emotionally, socially, et cetera, et cetera, um, to give them the opportunity, you know, to proceed. Uh, Tim talked about um, in his classroom who were at the lower end of the age range who sometimes struggle. Well, again, if you put on my parent hat, I had children at the November, end of November, December type of uh, birth dates who were at the other, you know, at that end and were highly successful. So I'm sure there was a mix in Tim's classroom and in all the teachers' classrooms uh, because every child is different. And I think, you know, from I think day one of my board service, I have really tried to give every single child the opportunity to flourish and be successful to the maximum that they're able to do. And I think by being so rigid and inflexible, when this December 1st day was probably set 50 years ago, long before kids went to daycare and preschool and for years and years before they entered kindergarten, that when you do read the research, there, there isn't a hard and fast definitive answer here. 
Um, I've read reports where kids that started at an earlier age were highly successful and that the red-shirted kids uh, who came in with bigger bodies and, you know, uh, felt that they didn't really have to work hard, by the end of third or fourth grade were, were slipping off and, you know, they were having a hard time. So I, I go back to the letters that we got from the parents and, you know, we as board members are here to represent our community and to bring forth their issues and their concerns and their questions. Um, beginning last year, we had our first question from a parent um, regarding, you know, why are we doing it the way we're doing it? And so we began investigating the issue. Um, this year, we had more parents come forth that said that they as parents really wanted the opportunity to let their children flourish, and they feel that they would flourish best in a kindergarten setting. I would like to give them that opportunity. Um, we have compromised with the report in the sense of making a little few more demands on the part of the parent and the child than even the Shenandoah policy. Um, and I'm comfortable with that, having one of our staff people actually go into the child's classroom and see the child in an educational type setting. And so we've, in a sense, compromised. We've taken the input from the teachers. Um, we may come to a, a different conclusion. And here again, we're only probably talking two or three kids a year. But in, in my state of mind, again, I just, I have seen young kids flourish in the classroom and go on to very successful careers and they weren't traumatized, they, they, they didn't, uh, you know, have ill effect for life. And I would really like us to give the children an opportunity. Um, it's a rigorous program that they would have to go through. And again, I know their sensitivity. Carrie mentioned it and Tara mentioned it. Oh, you know, the, the staff worked so hard and they put together this report. And we've taken consideration. And as I said, we've, we've added extra things. We've And, you know, we, we have sort of worked hand in hand, but as I said from the beginning, the main reason that I serve on this board is to advocate for the child. And I see this as, as, as one of those times. And uh, I, I just hope that, you know, I want to hear from the other board members too, but um, I hope we can go forward with this proposal. Gloria, do you want to add to this? Well, I, I wanted to ask Barbara a question of uh, your understanding of the Shenandoah policy. Um, is the parent who's challenging uh, the, the date uh, responsible for getting the child tested uh, by a yes. psychologist uh, of their own? Yes. So th this is a, so the parent of any child uh, who wants to challenge the, the, the policy has to pay for testing. This is a cost that they're going to have to incur. Yes, it is. It, it, what bothers me that it, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about kids, who, you know, parents who don't have that kind of money, who can't do that kind of thing. So is this becoming, you know, a matter of who has the money to do it? I, I just throw that out. I just happened to think of that while you were talking, and I was looking at the report and seeing all these tests and saying. Well, you have to have some money if you're going to have to pay for all these testing, uh, unless the district is absorbing them. But obviously, the, the district is not absorbing, uh, unless may, maybe some of the observational pieces. Right. In other is words, if, if one of our staff people come in to observe, if if the child, you know, passes X, Y, and Z, and then it goes to Damien, he feels that they've done that. And we added on an additional there that one of our staff be personally see the child in the classroom setting, which in the hall does not do. Okay, thank, thank you, Barbara. Um, I, I guess I want to go back to a couple of comments. Uh, I know Alan said something about, you know, looking at pros and cons, uh, and Tim suggested some things about the research out there. And I, I read anything that came to us by email and anything I get my hands on, and uh, it's... And I remember bugging Marie. I said, I hope the committee comes up with a pro-con, you know, kind of a list.
but it's so obvious from reading the the, um, the material that's out there that it, it's really not. You're not going to be able to come out with a, a list and determine, make your decision that way. Uh, it's it's very much a matter of the individual that we have to deal with. Um, and I guess I come down a, a number of the, of, the, of the remarks that Tim uh, his his he made. Uh, I felt very comfortable with, and I felt like you know I wanted to chime in then, but I didn't. Uh, as an educator myself, and having worked with kids in the classroom, uh, I can see the effect of pushing kids too quickly. And you know, as, especially in middle school, of course, that's when it hits a lot. When you've had kids that have uh, accelerated too quickly or, or entered too quickly, and, and they're the younger of the kids, um, uh, I have no problem with keeping the policy we have. Uh, I would support even moving it to September first. I think having a date is having a date. Uh, and I think we, you know, we, we have to think of the of the entire district. We have to think of this classroom. Uh, and sometimes it, we do have to think of an individual. But when I listen to the teachers and listening uh, and reading some of the things about the effect uh, that could be on a whole classroom, then I have to think more broadly. And then and, and then I kind of lean towards thinking in terms of, well, what are we doing to these individual classrooms, and uh, how will it affect those uh, all kids rather than just an individual child. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm leaning right now, I'm, I'm feeling very strongly uh, that I would support keeping the policy we have or moving, in, even changing the date to September 1st. Thank you, Gloria. I see my away. Sure. Um, I know we talked about this in policy. I think it's over a year because I think it came up last year. Um, so for me, the big thing that stood out to me after everything, hearing all the anecdotes and emails is, <coughs> It's just inconclusive. You know, we read like so many peer-reviewed articles that it, it doesn't say either way. So I was really torn about it because I know as a parent, it's, it's, it's hard to be objective. So when we hear from all the parents that their kid um, is somebody who they think is ready for kindergarten, um, I guess you have to take that with a grain of salt. But I think um, the recommendation from the committee that their, you know, their language is something that I could would, would support. So I think it was a school psychologist who said something like the average age of the classroom makes a big difference. And so that's why I think they had that January 31st cutoff versus much later. So it's not a huge range. So that average age of the kindergarten class would still be, you know, not much bigger. And I think Kathy said, and other people have said in the past, um, with that language, I can't imagine how many, uh, kids would actually be entering. And so we've talked about um, being flexible and meeting the needs of all learners, being inclusive. Um, and like Teresa mentioned, some parents making that decision to hold their child back. I just feel like everything kind of leads me to go based on the experts who came up with the, the language of that policy. So I think having, you know, con staying with this current policy, I think is c kind of inflexible, although I can understand and respect all the work um, and the advice that we got from the district, but it's inconclusive. So I think having that, I guess, some people might call it stringent. I would, I would go based on what they recommend. And so I, I would support the policy and the language that they come up with. I just have one other question or comment. Sure. I guess I'm kind of confused, and that's why I made my comment about there's no pros and cons. On the, the one of the pages there where it's committee recommendations, it's in bold and it's highly uh, based on careful ex and extensive review, they've come up with not changing the policy. And then in the next paragraph, we have in the report, should the board not heed the recommendation, we'll give you an alternative. That's, I, I find that very confusing, why we'd have a report that says no, but should you say not, should you not agree with no, here's an alternative. Especially when we don't have, like I said, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but there's no positive things in there. The only thing I dra got out of all the, the, the stuff before that was that we saw nothing but negatives, even though the first couple paragraphs said there's really nothing that says it harms either way. So again, I kind of, with, with Teresa, it's like, you know, it's kind of an individual thing, and since we're only dealing with one or two kids a year, I'm really struggling with why this is such a hurdle for us to jump over. So I think to to respond to your first point, that the charge from the board was 
what is your recommendation? And then if that recommendation were no, but the I think we asked them to go that route, which okay. is why it's confusing. Um, but like you, I, f I find myself struggling with this, with the inflexibility of the current policy, because I think there will be an exceptional student here and there that could meet criteria and really benefit from starting early. However, I'm torn because all of our experts here are recommending that we not change the policy. And so I'm not sure if I could, in, in good conscience, ignore those recommendations from the per people who have worked so hard to come up with this. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I stand now, wrestling with those two different aspects. And I think uh, we've put this on the agenda this evening as an information item only. So I think we will plan to vote on this at the next meeting. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to say at this time? Can I just jump in for a second here on the, the comment that Alan made and what's confusing? So when the committee came together, their charge was to uh, look at the issue kind of straight out. Do we want to have a waiver uh, to our existing policy? But at the same time, the board had already done a first read on language that just adopted the Shenandoah language. So um, it was prudent for the committee to also look at the Shenandoah language. And while I had this room full of experts together, feedback on that. So that's why you have two layers of recommendation. And it's premised on the fact that we had already done a first read several months ago on language. So if that clarifies it all. Thank you, Murray. Yeah, it does, but I, I don't think I was on the board when that was taken, taken care of, so that's why I was kind of confused. I didn't realize that. Is there anybody else? Could I, could I just add a couple of things, Trev, that the people that sent us letters? Sure. Um, Two of them that jumped out at me was this one child that was born seven and a half hours too late. Uh, another another child who has already been asked by their preschool to move up a grade or two uh, in their preschool setting. And, and others who share their experience with their own children who have no stake in the game, so to speak, but who supported the change because within their own families they had seen such a wide range of abilities in their own children. In one case, they had held one child back and redshirted the child, and in the other case, they felt that the child would have been ready. And it's it's stories and things like that that, uh, as I said, really moved me to allow a child to flourish if they're ready. That's it. Thank you, Barb. Anybody else? Teresa. Um, I'll just like to say I definitely agree with what Barb is saying, but I also would also say that no matter what date you put in there, there's always going to be the person who's born a minute after that date. Um, and I completely agree. I will again, though, say I just think both dates of December 1st and January 31st to me just sound arbitrary. I really think it should be a date that makes sense. And if that date ends up being September 1st, but allowing for whatever, I think a compromise in my eyes would be either changing it to September 1st and allowing for children that are born that calendar year to December 31st to be allowed to come in, or making it December 31st as the hard date and changing that. And parents always have the option to hold their child back. But I do have a question, and I don't know if that's something that we can because we're gonna we're gonna um, hold this back till to vote on it for next meeting. You said mm -hmm. um, if we could get information with children with disabilities, um, if they're having services, do they have to attend school in order to get those services? So that children who maybe would have rather have held been held back are now being pushed to mm -hmm. come in in order to get those services. Yeah, that's a good question. That's one that was raised at the PTA council meeting, and I, I think we were going to look into it. Marie, did you get an opportunity to look into that? 
I'm sorry, I could, I could only hear about every other word of Teresa's, so what, what was that? It related to the issue we discussed at PTA Council that Kim Blasiak brought up about um, students with special needs and services and having to start at a certain time and not having the opportunity to start later. Do you remember that? Kim, you might be able to describe it better than what I am. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> she looks frozen. Hi. Yeah, the question was, um, at times there are children who, like I'll use Alex for ex an example, only because I'm not going to use other names in the district, but he has a November 21st birthday. Ideally, we would have loved to defer him. However, we weren't given the option because he needed to receive services. So he had to come in early. Um, there are parents in this district who I have spoken to that their children were brought in early, were not given the option of deferment. Some have actually gone to class in diapers just so they could get services. So I guess our concern was we want to make sure if children, which there are children over the age who at age four are probably ready for kindergarten. Um, but at the same time, kind of looking on the back end of that, the kids who aren't ready for kindergarten that we really want to hold back, that kind of have to start the process. So we just wanted to make sure that it was it was even across the board. Murray, is that something that we looked into yet, or we're still waiting on that? That decision isn't made at the district level. Still available? She might be able to. But we don't just we don't decide eligibility age for pre preschool uh, services. That's that's a state level decision. Uh, it's not preschool. Wow. It's How early can they get preschool? preschool services. I think so we're talking about kindergarten. It, can I ask Kim to come back up just for clarification? Yep, probably, I think. Marie, Lisa's coming to the mic. I, I don't have the expertise to comment on, uh, on that particular piece, so I think a step back and we, we can look into that some more. Good evening. Hi. I think if I'm understanding the question and the concern, the Committee on Preschool Special Education is the committee that oversees the services for students who are not yet kindergarten age. So that is determined by state education regulations. Any student who fall, who turns five by the December 1st cutoff falls under the school age CSE. So we do have families who determine not to send their students to kindergarten, but they have to fall under the school age CSE in order to receive services. So the school age CSE will review and determine what services they would be eligible, and those families typically have to bring their student to our campus to receive related services if they need, just needed speech or OT or anything like that. So the CPSE and CSE still have to work within the confines of the state cutoff of December 1st for a five-year-old. Um, that's well, what happens with a four-year-old that needs services? They fall under the CPSE. It's a different... Okay, so they could... They would still receive services they if they qualified under the CPSE, which is the Preschool Special Education Committee, which are different providers. Typically, they're provided in their setting or in their home or in their preschool. But if the child needed OT as a four-year-old in the preschool or as an older four-and-a-half-year-old, say, they could still get those services. They wouldn't be denied services because they don't enroll in kindergarten. Right, but if they don't enroll in kindergarten by the December 1 cutoff, say they're red-shirted, for lack of a better term, they fall under the school-age CSE, so they still can get services, but it's through school-age and provided at our site. Okay, I think Kim's concern was... They didn't go to kindergarten they wouldn't get these services that's not true i mean we do if they qualify for services under school age cse we determine what appropriate services they are and how they're going to be delivered so for clarification 
they just have to show up at the school to get those services, but they don't actually have to enroll Correct. in kindergarten. They still, okay. They're still entitled to the services. They don't have to enroll in kindergarten. Okay. okay. may look differently because they're not in a school setting. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So if there are no other comments on this, we will move back up to the 2018-19 budget development presentation. Neil, thank you for your patience. <laughs> problem. Uh, good evening. Uh, we have two topics this evening. We're going to talk about state aid and review the tax levy limit calculation for the 2018-19 school year. I'll start talking a little bit about the executive budget proposal that came out about three weeks ago. And in that, Governor Cuomo proposed a 3% increase in state aid for education, or $769 million. I've detailed how that is broken up terms of allocations. Uh, at, at the top is foundation aid. That's the basic aid that follows every student and in New York State. That's $288 million distributed across all schools. Part of that also, well not part of that, in addition to that, there's another $50 million that goes to what are called community schools. So this is an effort in low income poverty areas to provide community resources within a school setting. And uh, that's been a line item in the budget. It is under the category of foundation aid, so that's continuing, but it's $50 million allocated for that purpose. And then we have expense-based aids, BOCES aid, transportation aid, building aid, things of that sort, where we spend money and get reimbursed. In total, that's $317 million that's proposed. Fiscal stabilization fund, $64 million. Uh, that's really a discretionary fund. It will be allocated throughout the budget process, so it's hard to say what that's going to be used for at this time. And the remainder of the list is $50 million. It's grant-based, and it's really targeting uh, high-needs school districts, so they have to apply for funding if they have programs they want to institute. Different categories, you can see before, you know, three- and four-year-olds, there's after-school programs, college readiness programs, so there's a variety of programs within there where there's money allocated that schools can apply for, but it is all on, based on need. In terms of our particular state aid run, we'll start with what we budgeted for state aid in the current year, and that's $25.4 million. You can see the categories uh, there on the left, foundation aid, BOCES aid, excess costs, which is for students with disabilities, hardware and technology, software library textbooks, transportation, and building aid. Our actual aid that we'll receive this year according to the run provided by the governor, uh, $25,046,260. That's, we're within $53,000 of what we budgeted, so we're in pretty good shape. Our margin of error was pretty slim this past year, so we got it almost right in terms of what the actual aid run looks like. Uh, that, that would be an increase of 0.21% over budget. And then when we look at the run that we got for next year, we're at $25,000. $1,550,577, that's an increase of $117,494 over our budget. And we're really looking, when we develop a budget, it's budget to budget, whether it's expenses or revenue. So we'll look at it in that regard, not so much the percentages and totals projected by the governor. And that's a 0.46% increase um, between those two categories. There are some aid revisions. We touched on the first one a little bit earlier in the community conversation. There is a proposal in the budget to more closely align state reimbursement for summer school special education tuition costs with the same wealth equalized ratio used for school year programs. So as I mentioned previously, up to now they've been, those tuition costs for the summer have been aided at 80%. Our wealth equalized ratio is about 47%. So if this were to go into effect, if we look at numbers that we're projecting for next year, we're looking at a potential state aid loss of about $175,000 due to this one proposal at the top of the list. There also is a proposal in the 2018-19 budget that's slated to go into effect next in 2019-20, and that's what is termed reigning in expense-based aids. So for transportation and BOCES aid, the annual increases would be capped at 2% or less if that's what the formula derives. Uh, we did take a look, I took a look at this, if it were in effect this year, uh, BOCES aid wouldn't be affected, but our transportation aid, we would lose about $48,000 uh, if that proposal were in play in the coming year. In terms of building aid, 
It's a cap again at 2%, but it's a little bit different. It looks at it on a statewide basis as opposed to within a school district. And again, if the statewide total increase for building aid exceeds 2%, what would have to happen here is every school district would have their building aid prorated downward. So we, we're looking at an aggregate pool. What we do understand is there's a lot of large school districts throughout the state, city, a school districts that have a lot of building projects going on that's going to add to the pool. Um, so it, it, this one's a wild card in terms of how do you predict what might happen in any given year because building aid comes on and goes off depending on what projects are occurring. So that one is much harder to calculate what the impact could potentially be. Um, so there's a couple things that concern us about that proposal and we'll have to see if it gets any traction going forward or not. In terms of the tax levy limit or property tax cap, that's an eight-step formula that limits the vast majority of expenses to 2% or less and it's based on the preceding calendar year consumer price index. And it really results in what's a threshold amount. And if the tax increase is less than the threshold amount, we need 50% of the voters voting yes to have a passed budget. If the tax increase is greater than the threshold amount, we would need 60% of the voters to approve the budget to have a passed budget. And the stick behind this is if the budget is ultimately defeated, and that would have to occur two times, no increase in the tax levy is permitted. So we would have to remain at the current tax levy that we have in the current year with no increase, which would be devastating. In terms of the formula itself for next year, we start with the prior year tax levy, which is the current year tax levy, levy of 70.7 million. We get to apply what's called the tax-based growth factor, and this comes from, from the state. And it's really a representative of new construction that's occurring within the district boundaries. And there's a factor that's given for that. So Gilderland, we're fortunate. We do have construction that's occurring. We have a positive factor for that. Uh, that increases, uh, it's, it's 1.0115, so that gets us, us up to 71.5 million. That's an $813,000 increase in the formula on the good side. Uh, then what we have to do according to the formula is take away our capital expenditures, net of state aid, and this is really for debt related to school construction and the purchase of buses. That gets us our adjusted prior year tax levy then comes in the CPI factor. This year, the CPI was 2.13%. The maximum we can have is 2%, so we're capped at the 2%, and that's applied in the formula. That gets us down to 70.4 million. And that's really what's called the tax levy limit calculation, the 1.4 million almost increase on that side. But then we have to back some things out. Um, pilots or payment in lieu of taxes, we haven't had those in the past. We do have one for next year in the town of Gilderland that will come into effect. So we have to subtract that according to the formula. And then again, we have to calculate what our expenditures would be for school construction, and buses, net of state aid. It's going down a little bit. We get to add that back in. Overall, we can increase our tax levy limit by 1,585,517, which is a 2.2% increase. There may be some minor revisions to, to the formula going forward as new information comes available, but that's where we are at the moment and we we'll, should be close to that at the end of the process. In terms of a summary of what we talked about this evening, we're looking at an executive budget state aid increase, and again this is budget to budget of approximately $117,000. We have a maximum allowable tax levy growth of $1,585,000. That means our maximum expenditure growth can be just over 1.7 million or 1.8%. So kind of where is our revenue increasing? And then what does that mean we can do on the expenditure side? And again, just to recap the budget proposal on future state aid, the 2% cap for transportation aid, BOCES aid, and building aid undoubtedly will cause an additional strain on local school district, school district budgets. And in the proposal, it does talk about freeing up some aid to make some uh, progressive changes to foundation aid, but there's no guarantee that says any of that money that will be saved, if any, or all, or a portion thereof, would go for that purpose. It just talks about that as a stated outcome, uh, but without any guarantee behind it. And that's my presentation for this evening. Is there any questions? Teresa? I, I just had a question, um, Neil, regarding the pilot program. Um, you had said 
Oh, I'm sorry. I just saw it later. So next year's pilots is the 72404 that will go into next year's 1819 budget. Correct. That pilot will come into play will next come, year. It, it'll be a, a reduction of what we're getting in. Yeah, it works negatively in the first year. So when pilots first come on, it lowers your tax levy limit threshold. Okay. Um, next year it'll be on the front end. It's it's a 10-year pilot. So next year, that 72,000 will move up to the top of the calculation. So it'll be added in or subtracted out, and then the change will be um, added back in in the following year. So you'll be paying the net difference. The net year to year will impact the formula going forward. But it's the first year you get the full effect of the pilot. So it'll be less. It'll still be in effect. It'll just be less of an effect the following year. Right, because we'll be looking at just the year-to-year -year difference in the two numbers. What was the pilot in 1819, and what's the pilot expected to be in 1920? And, and it'll be the difference between those two numbers. So the first year it's coming on board, though, it does lower our tax levy limit threshold. Okay. Ten years out, it will. when it ends, it will benefit us on the front end of the calculation. Okay, so each year we'll notice a lessening of that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Alan? Yeah, can you explain that one part about the uh, realigning in expense based aid proposal 2019 2020 with the building aid? Because that, I didn't quite get it. And when you read your bullet point, it, it's kind of confusing because an increase would be a proration downward. So I don't understand how that can be. So the way the system works right now, we submit data on our on our construction projects and we get building aid for that based on aid ratios that we have set for the district so um, if you spend a certain amount of money in debt payments every year each school district has their own building aid ratio so you can you know with certainty what you're going to be getting back when you do your debt schedule so if you have your debt schedule over a number of years 15 years typically you would know what your principal and interest payment is you would know what you would be getting in aid for that year uh, so you can budget for all of that on a year-to-year -year basis. What that's, what this proposal would do, would basically say, if the pool is not exceeds two percent, our aid ratio, um, which is currently 68 percent, may be in a subsequent year it may drop to 50 percent. So we're still making the same principal and interest payment, but all of a sudden our revenue stream it can be different. In it, the way the the plan looks like is we can go up and down. So depending on the statewide pool in the following year, uh, maybe we re regain some ground. Okay, we get more revenue in the next year, maybe it drops off again. So we can't with any certainty predict the revenue side. We do know that we have the set principal and interest payments. So we know the expense side. It'll be a variable revenue side, which okay. is going to be difficult to, to do on a year to year basis. And really when we go out for a capital project, as you know, what we talk about is what's the task impact of that proposal over the course of 15 years and we work with our financial advisors and we're able to map that all out. This will kind of take away the, our ability to do that if this proposal were in effect because we couldn't say with certainty what our aid will be in any year of the debt. Okay, so, uh, so I understand it. So if said a different way is if there's a 2% cap on a number and it, the actual amount is greater than 2% cap, the difference between the cap amount and the actual amount you're penalized for that in a downward trend. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So there's okay. there's All a right. pool of money. I, I got it now. I just that yep. and the other thing that was kind of confusing is you said there's a big municipal uh, school district with and that's going to help us. That's because it's going to those are going to be in the base before we start doing the two percent cap. Well, the chances are when those start those projects come online and start to get aided that we're going to push over the two percent. Okay. Now. That's. Oh. So, All right, I got you now. I didn't get that when you said that. Thank you for the clarity. Any other questions? Thank you, Neil. You're welcome. The next item on our agenda this evening is approval of the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of the January 23rd, 2018 meeting, the CPSC and CSE recommendations, personnel action items, and the financials, which include the internal claims report. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Alan, second Judy. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. 
And now we move on to information items, curriculum and instruction information. Damian? Thanks very much. Uh, I'm pleased to report that on Jan January 30th at Farnsworth Middle School, the district and the Gilderland Public Library co-hosted a screening of the documentary Screen Agers. We had well over 200 parents and community members in attendance. There was a rich discussion between audience members and a panel of Gilderland High School and Farnsworth Middle School students. It was skillfully moderated by Matt Creighton of grade 12. Feedback we received was very positive, and we want to give a special thanks to Mike Laster for hosting at Farnsworth, Natalia Lemoyne, our coordinator for uh, educational technology, Mike Bastian, Jamie Schneider, and Sarah Falco for their assistance, and of course, a big thank you to the students who served on the panel. <coughs> I have some news from the art department, two uh, very impressive items for you. We had recently 10 high school art students who had work selected for an exhibition in the Art in Three Dimensions 2018 show at the Mahanasan Art Gallery. Their art teachers are Kyle Green and Meredith Best. Of the 254 entries, 114 pieces were selected by three jurors. The opening reception for the exhibit was February 7th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. There were presentations at 7 p.m. that evening. Uh, the show does, however, run through February 28th, and we want to note these students. They are Brian Mar Mariner of grade 10, Dylan Gizzi of grade 10, Sydney LaPose, also 10th, Zachary Arain, uh, Arain of grade 10, Dominic Malon of grade 10, Marie Van Gelder, 12th grader, Nathan Cow, a 9th grader, Irene Montini of 9th grade, Samantha Varner of grade 12, and Tanner Mikowski of grade 11. So congratulations to them, very well deserved recognition. And then final uh, item also from the art department, who's uh, celebrating some great accomplishments recently. We had a number of students who are uh, a region at large Scholastic Art Awards, which was established in 1923. The Scholastic Art and Writing Awards are the nation's, nation's largest, longest running, most prestigious visual and literary arts program recognizing creative accomplishments of students in grades 7 through 12. It is a symbol of excellence that can bolster resumes, college applications, and scholarship applications. All of the national medalists are in a place in the national medalist recipient list. Selected works will be featured in the National Catalog, uh, the Best Teen Writing Anthology, and the Art Right Now exhibition program. Receiving a Scholastic Award offers the opportunity for scholarships <coughs> Excuse me. at the regional level. Seniors who receive awards have access to more than $3.5 million in scholarships from local institutions. At the national level, $10,000 scholarships are given to 16 graduating uh, seniors whose portfolios earn gold medals. Silver medals with distinction portfolio recipi recipients receive $1,000 scholarships. Seniors who earn uh, these honors can leverage partial to full ride scholarships from a network of 60 arts universities and institutes, which annually earmark $5 million in additional support. And we're pleased to announce that this year's GHS award winners are Hyman Wong, uh, honorable mention for self-duality, Hyman Wong again for honorable mention in, uh, for Broken Dialogue. Hyman Wong, Silver Key Farmer's Market in the Empire State. Julia Liu, uh, Gold Key for Resilience. Anastasia uh, Prigorodova, sorry if I butcher that, a Silver Key in Celestial Russ. Helen Yang, Gold Key for The Melting Pot. And Gold Key winners advance to the National Scholastic Awards. So congratulations to them. Thank you to Shannon Elliott, the instructional administrator for the art department, and of course to the great teachers who are guiding them. So well done. Thank you. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Next, we move to school business information. Neil? Recently, the New York State Office of the State Comptroller released its annual report measuring the amount of fiscal stress schools are operating under based on data from the 2016 17 school year. The Comptroller's office created a a tool that looks at various financial and environmental factors and using a weighted scoring system converts those weighted scores into one of four designations, either significant fiscal stress, moderate fiscal stress, susceptible to fiscal stress, or no designation. At least a report for the third year in the row that Gilderland received no designation indicating that the financial indicators reviewed were not indicative of any potential fiscal stress. Great. Thank you, Neil. Now we move to superintendent information items. Murray? Uh, my first item is uh, regarding our joint trustee meeting with the Gilderland Public Library. 
Each year we have our annual meeting where members of both of those boards come together to talk about topics of mutual interest. I had shared some dates for February and it turned out that none of them were going to work. Uh, tonight I have two more dates for you to consider. They are March 12th, 14th. It's a Monday or a Wednesday. So um, I will have uh, Deb Sims send something around tomorrow so you don't have to check your calendars now. But hopefully those dates will work out for a good number of our board members. I'm and the agenda will be out shortly thereafter. March 13th is a board. Next item is it's just Wednesday. a reprise of our conversation earlier today. I just want to remind the community that we continue to be very interested in their preliminary feedback as we work on the development of our budget. So the survey results that we released earlier tonight will be posted to the website soon. Uh, we also have individual proposals uh, posted to our website in four categories, and we invite uh, as many individuals as would like to send some emails to give us feedback on each of those four groups of proposals. I remind everyone that we'll be presenting the budget on March 6th. We'll be hosting a budget question and answer session the following week on the 13th. That's part of a regular board meeting. And then, of course, uh, individuals are welcome to participate um, on the 13th as part of the Q&A, and they're welcome to come to any board meeting and provide their feedback during public comment. Soon we'll be putting together a, a FAQ, a frequently asked questions about the budget, as soon as we get some frequently asked questions. So that will be posted um, probably early March. And then lastly, I just want to let everyone know that uh, Assembly Member Pat Fahey will be joining us at the board meeting on March 6th. Senator George Amador will be joining us at the March 13th board meeting. And I've indicated to both, we'll put them right at the start of the meeting and um, accommodate their schedules as best we can. Any questions? Any questions for Murray? Thank you, Murray. Next, we move to board president information. There's two items this evening. The first relates to the Handbook for Better School Board Operating Procedures, Section 4, Planning. This section was provided to all board members this evening, and I believe revisions are due back by April 10th, 2018. And I think that the Communications Committee um, will be reviewing these revisions and that Deb Sims is in the process of compiling them and putting them all together. Marie, is that correct? Thank you. Um, the next item is Board of Education policy review. There's a few policies up for a first read this evening. We already discussed the entrance age policy. Um, there are a couple others on here. I don't know, Kathy or Barbara, if either one of you want to speak to the other items that are on this list. I think they're, you know, they're pretty self-explanatory, so I don't think it needs any further review. Okay. Thank you, Barb. I, I, I do have a question on one of them. The, sure. The 5313.3-R student suspension regulation, there's a section in there that you're changing, and it looks, my question really is, is the changes that we're making, is that really in the best interest of the student? Because it, it, it doesn't, at first read, it didn't, like it, it didn't look like it did, so I, I didn't quite understand what we were trying to accomplish. So... Can we, does anybody know in that? I, I can weigh in on this. Um, this is a recommendation for a change that came directly from Jeff Honeywell, our school attorney, um, just in reference to uh, capturing in language what our obligations are. Yes, language actually exceeded what needed to be and put us in a position of needing to adjudicate whether or not someone's desire to attend school is is sincere, which is very hard to do. So um, Jeff suggested that we replace the paragraph that's um, the new language. OK, I, I didn't get the background, so thanks for the background. That's what my really my question is, what the background for the change was. Thank you. And then I also have another question on the copyright one. Does anybody actually audit or monitor our compliance with those copyright 
uh, policy or regulations that we have there? Jamie, do you want to jump in on that one? We've been talking about it a lot. Um, I don't believe there are any audits of copyright policy, but certainly publishers pay close attention to it. Um, okay, so we're being audited by them. So if we violate it, they'll let us know. That okay, that's that, that, okay. That's that's fine. I just didn't. I read that, and I'm going. That it sounds like we're monitoring it, and we are, but we aren't. We're mon we're using an outside we source to monitor. To the degree that we can possibly monitor it. Well, that was the other question. Is like if you, if you are monitoring, I don't know how you could monitor it because like making copies of certain things and making sure that you, you someone hasn't made ten or fifteen more copies than you're supposed to. I don't know how you're right. I monitoring think, I think that. It's, it's more about Educate. educating people and making sure that they're well informed about okay. copyright law and fair use. I get that now. I didn't when I read that. I was trying to read it literally, and that, it just didn't make sense. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, we move on to. Yes. Christine, uh, under the policy 5140, uh, entrance age, mm -hmm. uh, I believe we might want to change one word uh, in the third highlighted paragraph. And I, I, I emailed this to Barbara. It says, only children who will reach the age of five by January 31st of the year. And then it says the word in, and it probably should be for which parents are requesting early entrance. Right. Okay, that makes sense. That is correct. That, and Bar Barbara did, did agree with that. Thank you for that. Correct. We needed a grammatical change. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to action items, school business management action. Neil? is a resolution to offer a school bus and vehicle bond proposition for the May 15, 2018 school budget vote and election. It's the recommendation of the Business Practices Committee for approval and authorization for a voter proposition to be placed on May 15th again. To spend up to $1,117,700 for the purchase of eight 66 passenger buses, one 60 passenger wheelchair bus, one minivan, and one large track mower for maintenance across the park. At the bond resolution before you prepare by bond council, and we will need a roll call vote. A roll call vote. Okay. May I have a motion to approve the resolution to authorize school bus and vehicle bond proposition? Kathy, second. Seema? Are there any questions or comments? Okay, Linda? This is Barbara. Yes. This is Federico. Yes. This is Gita. Yes. Ms. Hayes? Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Rivera? Yes. Mr. Simpson? Yes. Mrs. Slack? Yes. Mr. Tol Mrs. Tolkill? Yes. Tim. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one other item this evening is a recommendation to approve the service agreement with advanced therapy to provide educational services for May I have a motion to approve the service agreement? Teresa, second, Judy. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 9-0. Thank you, Neil. Now we move down to superintendent action items. Marie? So I have one item. This is a, an item that came before the board um, earlier this year when uh, a couple students who are members of the used to be called Engineering for Girls and Boys Club uh, came and asked if they could have their name changed to Engineering for Girls or E4G. And if you'll recall, I um, did some research on that with our school attorney who advised that it would not be an appropriate name because the name suggests that boys would be excluded from the club, even though in reality, uh, young men would be welcome in it. So Mr. Lutzik worked with the students in the club and also consulted with our attorneys and they have come up with a new name <coughs> and an E4G squared, that little carrot is a squared mark, an exponent, which stands for Engineering for Girls and Guys. And they asked if I would bring it forward to the board for your approval and I wholeheartedly recommend this change. 
May I have a motion to approve the co-curricular co club name change? Judy, second, Kathy. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Passes 9-0. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. We'll have some very happy students tomorrow. <laughs> Now we move on to board president action items, of which there is one this evening, and that relates to the land transfer from the Gilderland Public Library. Uh, the library has expressed a desire to donate to the school district two vacant parcels of land right near the library. Um, so may I have a motion to approve the land transfer? Kathy, second. Judy, um, I will open this up for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? Kathy. I'll, just, I'll just comment that um, Business Practices Committee um, reviewed this agreement at our last uh, meeting, um, and we had the school attorney there, um, and so we reviewed it with the, with the attorney. Okay. Alan? I, I have several questions. Uh, my first question is, is wh what are we going to do with this land and how it will be used for students? So... Okay. Okay, so why are we why are we doing this? Is this just to avoid the land being on the tax rolls? At this point in time, yes. Uh, why would we? I don't understand what what's in it for the school district. Why do we want to do that? Well, it, it really is, and we have to remember here we're talking about the same group of taxpayers. So whether they're uh, school district library taxpayers or school district taxpayers. So right now the situation was when, when the property was first acquired by the library, it went off the tax roll. So there was no, it was tax exempt at that point. And then somewhere along the way, the town has come back, reevaluated that, and determined that it really should be on the tax roll based on the library's non-use of the land. And they're a little bit different than the school district on the law in terms of tax exemption. So basically the town came back and said that it really you can't justify the exemption, so now we will have to remove the exemption and you'll have to pay tax. So at that point, it becomes taxable property for the school district. Um, so now we have school district library taxpayers <laughs> um, paying taxes to pay the school bill. So what we're doing is those taxes are collected by the library. They write a check to the school district. We collect the taxes on the property. What this will do is reverse everything back to, to where it was. So if we acquire the land, it will become tax exempt under the law because we're a school district. So there will no longer be a need for the library to tax property owners to pay a school tax bill. So it will put us all back to the same situation where we're not trading money back and forth. So if, if, if it's exempt under the school district, we will lose some revenue that we currently get now, but we're also we're only getting it from the library taxpayers. It's just an exchange from library taxpayer to school district taxpayer who are the same taxpayers. So it's going out of one pocket and putting it in another. And I think the simplest way to think about this, it eliminates the administrivia that comes along with this. So if it's tax exempt for the school's purposes, library doesn't own it anymore. There's no need to for one entity to tax the other entity and for the same tax taxpayers to take it out of one pocket and put it in another pocket. We don't need to do that exercise when we get rid of the administrative. We don't need to write a check and hand it to each other and us collect it and deposit it. It, it will just eliminate that aspect of it. And, and how was the library notified that the tax law, that the, the, the tax exempt status was nullified and it now became on the rolls? Is there a written document that was sent out that officially notified us that was shared with the school district that we could all see? Uh, well, it's it's public. It's on the tax. I mean, if you you can go out and look, and you can see that the parcel is is taxed. It's it's on online. The town of Gilbert So Post it just came up in taxes. The library wasn't given a notice like an assessor does, like with you or on your own personal property. It says your tax rate went, your assessed value went from zero to to two point three million dollars, for example. I, I wasn't involved in the conversation, but I'm. I, as far as I understand, what would normally happen in the situation, the assessor would notify the entity or the property owner that the exemption is is no longer valid and that the property would be going on the tax roll so um, but I have confirmed it, it is on the tax roll and, and we certainly have been receiving the taxes 
Okay. Does uh, I guess another question I have for it is, when we look at this from the perspective that it is, it is it going to be our, is the library ours or is it the, the or does the land current like how is the library is the library a property of the Gilliland School District or is the land owned by the library? Yes and yes. So <laughs> can you <laughs> explain how that works? Par parcels. Uh, the property on which the library is situated is owned by the school district. The, the library went on its own and acquired other parcels of property. And they have, I believe, three parcels of property they acquired themselves, not through the school district. Two of those are the ones in question that they acquired, uh, the two properties on Western Ave. The third one uh, they're using as a parking lot, and um, that is deemed tax exempt, as is the land that the the library is on um, but because those parcels are not being used for a library purpose at the moment the two parcels that we're talking about um, it was the decision of the assessor that they could not sustain the tax exemption and, and needed to go on the rolls okay and then just another thing that looks when you read the agreement it, that strikes me as odd even though it says that we own it but we really it's very highly restricted ownership of the property so again I find that kind of puzzling like why there would be such restrictions on it especially since we don't have any use for it um, we're working with the advice of council we're trying to meet a number of objectives from the committee uh, there was a lot of, of work that was put into making sure that we had the opportunity under a number of conditions to return the land to the to the library if it didn't meet our needs so we weren't settled with the land down the road if, if many does, does the library have any long-term strategic plans to use it for anything? Um, not at the moment. Not for the school district to use it. Then why wouldn't they just sell it to put it back on the tax roll, which is where it is right now, so if they don't have any strategic use for it? I think the, the library has plans that might include that land, so they don't want to relinquish okay. the land at this point. Okay. But they also don't want to pay taxes on the land at this point. Okay. Hey, thanks for all that background information, because I didn't know any of it. Okay? Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on this? Can I comment a little bit? Sure. Um, just to answer Alan's question, even though the land under the library is owned by the school district, I don't believe the school district would ever try and by merging the two pieces now, basically that's $5,000 in books material that the taxpayer could have through the library, you know, with um, this book. This would then merge um, actually to come on. So if there's any future expansion for the library or if they want a parking lot, those would be able to be used for those yeah I, 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 I understand it my, my questions really were, were stem from like it sounds like we're doing this to get it off the, the rolls and again since we are that's one decision the other decision is since it's going to be reverted back to us and we already have ownership of the library I, I was also confused why we weren't once we get the ownership we don't consolidate the parcels so it's one and, and, and it always remains tax exempt and then if the if the library wanted to put a uh, uh, parking lot on it, I mean, again, since it's their, the, the, they put the library on it, so, I mean, like, why wouldn't they be allowed to put the, the parking lot on it since it's a school district library? So th that's where I'm con why I was confused and was asking all those questions because it just didn't seem to make sense that there was two distinct owners of the property for one person. We did have some conversation about merging it into one parcel, but our understanding from the town is um, if down the road the library or the school district wanted to sell the property, once it's merged together, it's a lot more difficult to separate those parcels out again, uh, more costly and more restrictive. Now we have to go through the town planning board, zoning board, and things like that. So maximum flexibility is we leave the two independent parcels as two independent parcels and not merge them. Uh, together that gives everybody the most flexibility going down the road thanks and again it's kind of important to know that and understand that and I, I did not so thank you again 
Anyone else? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? I probably should abstain. Okay. Um, passes eight with one abstention. And now we move on to board committee reports. Audit committee, Teresa. Hi. Um, our committee met this past um, Monday. Um, there was a few items on the agenda. Uh, one was the 2017-2018 internal audit special area report, um, which was given by a David Leather from Questar. Um, the report basically outlined uh, recommendations to manage user access rights and strengthen internal controls and make sure that we um, do them regularly. Um, the district will provide a draft corrective plan to the audit, um, the audit committee finding and recommendations to the committee to review and approve. Um, just typical claims auditor, annual discussions and internal claims. Um, the reserve balance policy, um, which we uh, discussed with John Rizzo. Um, an amendment to the education law requires the school districts beginning this year to post a schedule of reserve funds with balance as of March 31st and disclose any planned use of such reserves for the following fiscal year with the final annual budget documents. Uh, the committee approved um, the reporting tool developed for sharing that to the required information with the Board of Education and Community. Um, there was a long-range financial report. Uh, and we discussed a district credit card. Um, the school district does not have a credit card in its name. However, a district card is needed for very limited use, particularly when making hotel reservations for out-of-area professional development opportunities for board members and, in some cases, staff members. David Leather, um, internal auditor with Questar BOCES, indicated that it's very common for school districts to have a district credit card and indicated that strict policies governing use can be developed to protect the district against fraudulent activities and overuse. Uh, he also will provide the district with sample policies from other districts and will provide the committee with recommendations to develop our own policy. As a first step, the committee was um, um, agreed to review a sample policy for a district, for a district credit card. And we have a, another uh, committee meeting the 28th of this month, uh, 28th at 8.15, Wednesday. Thank you. Next we move to business practices. Kathy? Uh, well, I guess we've already discussed our, our item of business uh, because we, um, as I mentioned, we, we had, we're together with our school attorney to discuss the um, agreement <coughs> to, uh, for the transfer of land from the library to the school district. That was our only order uh, item of business. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, communications? Gloria? Yes, our next, our next scheduled meeting is March 1st, and it will be at uh, 8 a.m. at Farnsworth. Great. Thank you. And now we move to policy committee. Barbara, is there anything else to add? Thank you. Now we move to public comment number two. Linda, has anybody signed up? Benjamin goes. Benjamin goes. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to weigh in since we're since I'm here um, on the kindergarten start age. Um, I know you've been inundated with uh, anecdotes, um, but I would like to mention that. Uh, I'm 20 years old, and I'm about halfway through law school, uh, a little over halfway. Um, so to Mr. Haran's point about, you know, we have to consider when we're starting them younger, you know, not just are they ready for kindergarten, but will they be ready for middle school? Will they be ready for college? Um, I graduated from Gillen High School a year early. Uh, I graduated at 17. I went to college at 17. Uh, I went to college as a junior at 17. Um, so I would say yes. 
um, uh, for the rare case. Um, and, I, and I think uh, what I really want to say is that from the back here, from the audience, it seems like the question is, if a four-year-old is ready to go to kindergarten, should we let them go to kindergarten? Because um, there's all these, we're not saying lower the age and allow four-year-olds in who may or may not be mature enough. We're saying um, after careful review by principals and psychologists and teachers um, and tests of this student, um, are they ready to go to kindergarten? Um, it may be that this four-year-old will be the most mature child in the class um, because we have all these kids who are automatically in um, because of their age, uh, even though they haven't been subjected to all these tests that decide whether they're ready or not. Um, so I just want to, I, you know, I just want to stress there's, there's class probability, which says generally it's a bad idea for four-year-olds uh, to go to kindergarten. Generally it's bad for 17-year-olds to go to college. Um, but there's case probability too, and all we know about the particular case is that it's part of the class, um, you know, the proposed policy is let's meet the child and see if they're ready to go to kindergarten. Um, and, I, and I, you know, um, you know, I understand the concerns, um, but I, I think that that maybe we're phrasing the question wrong because it it feels like the question is if the child's ready to go to kindergarten, uh, should we serve that child, you know, um, early? Thank you. Thank you. And now we move on to board issues, ideas, and sharing. Does anybody have anything to add? Judy? Just the Pops concert was great, as always. Um, and we have both the Mask production and the uh, GHS musical coming up. And I hope everybody will be able to go, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of talent, a lot of great things going on. Thank you. Damien, do we have the, the dates of the Mask performance and the... I know I'm putting you on the spot. It's okay. But we will certainly... Uh, the, the second and third weekends, I think. Okay. The, like the... I don't know what this, the 9th and the 16th or something like that. Those okay. might be the Thursdays ahead of them. Okay, so we will have a meeting before then where we can. At okay. Least, uh, yeah, yeah, March 2nd. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm. Anyone else? Tim? <laughs> yeah. I uh, just wanted to um, just maybe start some discussion on uh, the whole idea of uh, the drug issue in the school district, in the community. Um, opioid, heroin, all of that. It was something that I brought up uh, last year at the mm -hmm. Candidates Forum and some, some other opportunities. Um, yesterday in the Gazette, there was an article uh, titled New State Report on Opioid Deaths Released. And the subheading is Experts Believe Toll is Much Higher. Um, it's quite an interesting article, a lot of information. Uh, unfortunately, very depressing information. Um, uh, Legislator Amador is quoted quite a bit in there, so it would be, it might be a good topic in March when we have uh, Ms. Fahey and uh, Mr. Amador here. Um, and I just wonder if we can get a discussion going on, you know, what are we doing in the school district and uh, what more can we do and how much uh, expenses would be associated with that. Um, but I think it's an important topic. Um, you know, I know uh, firsthand that our, we have members in the community who are suffering greatly right now from uh, circumstances. Um, so when, when it gets to be real life and death struggles, uh, I guess I, I would hope we can, um, at the end of the article, Mr. Amador uh, is quoted as saying, um, this is something we should not be afraid to talk about. Um, we need the faith-based community involved. We need the business community involved. We need the private sector involved. We need the public sector involved. Uh, we certainly need um, the school district involved. And, and I know we are already. But uh, I, I guess I'm just wondering if we can find out, you know, like I said, what we're doing, what more we can do, um, and I would just highly advocate that this issue be declared almost like public enemy number one, um, because there it, it's it's a problem, and uh, 
you know, I, I campaigned on it and haven't said a word since. And, uh, you know, I've been whistling past the graveyard uh, just like maybe other people have. And uh, so I just wanted to throw it out there now just to at least get some discussion on it and see what we can do. And I, I hope we can pursue something. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea. Seema? Um, I guess, yeah, I would, I would be encouraged to do that too. I just had a question, I guess, for the district. Are there any talks about, um, and I don't know how far they are in plans of, you know, they're talking about developing um, buildings on 155 across from the middle school. And I didn't know if, like, at the district level are people talking about forming a committee or coming up with a, something to put out there about, you know, their, their views on that. Uh, the town uh, planning board has already had uh, one meeting, and uh, Marie and I were, were at that meeting. Uh, a lot of public comment. <laughs> um, it certainly has caught the attention of, of neighboring properties. Uh, Mike Laster, I know, has been in, in touch with people as well. Um, that is coming up again, uh, I think, in, in uh, March. We just got noticed they moved the date out a little farther. Um, but um, residents from around that area uh, certainly weighed in. Um, Marie spoke on behalf of the school district and, and <coughs> let her point of the district's point of view. Uh, so we have been engaged in the process and will be continue to be engaged in the process. Okay. I should probably note that that it's not going to be the status quo. I mean, it's not going to stay a golf course. So there's a number of proposals for that mm -hmm. property. So um, you know, it's the status quo is not is not an option. I don't think anymore. So I, I know that people like the status quo, but <laughs> not happening. Christine, I, I do have the dates if you want them. Oh, great. Uh, the Farnsworth Mask presentation is the 9th, 10th, and 11th of March. And the High School Musical is the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th of March. Of March. Great. Thank you, Damien. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I was thinking it as the words were coming out of my mouth. <laughs> um, is there anybody else? Okay. Um, and now we just need a motion to adjourn the meeting. Alan, second, Teresa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. <laughs>